I think when many of us were reading or watching through One Piece for the first time, we had several moments of, wait, hold on, so it's not just a wacky pirate manga? There's actually layers to this? Everything from Zoro's pledge to Sanji's quest of finding the All Blue to Nami's story. Each and every one explored different avenues of the core characters and the reasons behind their dedication to Luffy and the Straw Hat flag. But as a certified struggler, what to me always stuck out the most was when those seemingly unshakable loyalties were tested, betrayed, or even physically challenged. What I'm referring to are of course the events of Water 7 and Luffy's burden as a captain of the very unlikely crew that are the Straw Hat Pirates. As with everything in One Piece, we must remember that Oda is very much a long-form story enjoyer. So I think the roots of Water 7, if you will, go all the way back to the East Blue and those initial character narratives we saw. I think the simplest way of summarizing the East Blue as a whole is that it is largely the story of Nami, and how her role as the to-be navigator is sort of the first stress test of the Straw Hat Pirates as a whole. Without her, they have no guidance, no destination, they are simply lost. I think it's no coincidence that when we get our navigator, we head right for Logtown, the epilogue of the East Blue, and the prologue to the Grand Line. Unlike everything we'd be seeing later in the story, and particularly in Water 7, the first SOG answers the question of, could this even work? It doesn't test Luffy or any other members of the crew so much as it tests the unity of that chord that we established. When Nami flees back to Arlong Park, without so much as skipping a beat, Luffy knows that she has not betrayed them. And so the rest of the story we see is one of pursuits. When we catch up to Nami, we learn of the truth behind all of it very, very quickly. And after that, well, the rest is simple. We know of the chains holding Nami back, and so we sever them once and for all. It's a relatively straightforward quest with each and every member of the crew playing their part in bringing Arlong down. And it's through this first impossible triumph that the Straw Hat Pirates are truly forged. With our core crew settled, we then sail right into the first half of Paradise, where, to me, the overarching theme was always one of triumphs and unbreakable bonds. That is of course not to say that we didn't face any challenges or that we didn't also win battles before and after, but rather that each and every one of these little adventures before we reach Water 7 showed us just how far the crew are willing to go for each other, and not just for each other, but also to do the right thing in helping others. This is still a video about Water 7, so for the sake of time, I'll just briefly touch on some of the most explicit examples as, big surprise, Oda has very much interwoven those themes throughout the entire saga, culminating in, well, you know. One of our very first stops is of course Little Garden, an arc that, particularly in hindsight, is written almost exclusively for Usopp. Despite being a part of the original East Blue Squad, I think it's only really here that Usopp's true dream really blossoms in his admiration of Bragi and Dori. He certainly got his time to shine in his fight with Chu, but I think it's in seeing these two titanic creatures battle, and hearing their stories of this long battle that in and of itself is worth of eternal glory, that that flame is really lit inside of him. Elbaf and the Battle of Bragi and Dori are pretty clearly inspired by Norse mythology, where these sorts of duels are held up as one of the most honorable rituals. So Usopp's dream of becoming a brave warrior of the sea will certainly lead him there as well. But in the context of Water 7, this newfound admiration of fighting for what you truly believe in, not because you want to prove anyone wrong, but because you honor and respect your enemy, in Usopp's case his own captain, enough to challenge him to a straight up duel. Not to get ahead of myself, when taken in isolation, I think Little Garden functions as a sort of a little introduction to the wackiness of the Grand Line, while also showing us that even against or amongst giants, our crew will still find a way to prevail. With a mostly physical challenge out of the way though, Nami soon falls ill, and suddenly we have a far more, I suppose, insidious problem that we can't really solve with brains or brawn. Instead, we are forced to ask for help. Despite Vivi, someone who Luffy now considers a dear friend being shot, he steps over his usual principles and thinks of the bigger picture. Nami still needs help, let's not start anything else. Here we once again face many physical hardships as well, including scaling a literal mountain. But ultimately, I think it's a showcase of how strong their bonds are, and how they are willing to change for one another. Even in this strange wintry land, our crew not only meets one of the two best straw hats, Tony Tony Choppa, but we also grow even closer through this impossible task of saving Nami, while also fulfilling the dream of Hero Look, and of course in parts, also Choppers. But effectively, much of this arc revolves around the concept of asking for help. 
Not in the same way that Nami asked Luffy to help, but the crew as a whole. Though from the winter wonderland with cherry blossoms, we venture to Alabasta, which is what I would call the pinnacle of our first trials. The final boss of sorts before our next major voyage. Perhaps this is not entirely intentional, but I think Ace appearing here of all places as a reminder of where Luffy's journey began is another sort of Logtown moment, if you will. A reminder of what came before, but a symbol of what's yet to come. Unlike many of the previous arcs, Alabasta already goes much harder on our core fighters. But even against the ultra-bad crime boss Crocky, we remain steadfast to the point that we even turn Robin, the other best straw hat, to our side. Not just that, we also turn the very fundamental gears of the world in our brief alliance with small Kurintashigi. While many of the crew are definitely put through the ringer, the arc ultimately ends with what is still one of the strongest panels in the entire story. The X is on the Straw Hats' arms, signifying their unwavering unity amongst themselves as well as with Vivi. It is a parting and a bittersweet one of that, but it is still one of immense triumph. They challenged an entire crime syndicate, got caught up in a revolution, wandered deserts, and ultimately fought tooth and nail for their survival. But at the end of the day, the true princess has regained her place on the throne, and freedom has prevailed. It is bittersweet, and it does hurt. But both Vivi and the Straw Hats know that Alabasta need her, she should stay behind. Which finally takes us to the last major adventure, leading up to Oda's much spicier recipes. That, of course, being Skypea. If I called Alabasta the pinnacle of our first trials, then I would call Skypea the pinnacle of our adventures now that we have passed those trials. While still filled with challenges of its own, with us even facing off against a supposed god that just turns out to be a rap god, I think all of Skypea is the absolute embodiment of freedom. With the crew now made, we literally leave the regular world behind for a fantastical adventure in the clouds. Exploring long-lost cities of gold, entirely different cultures, and even otherworldly technology in the dials. Everything about it screams adventure that is only possible because of how tight-knit our crew is. Made even more intriguing because unlike the Straw Hats, our good buddy Blackbeard never makes it to Skypea. While he is definitely the antithesis of Luffy and in many ways pursues a certain kind of freedom himself, he does not have that adventurous spirit that is at the heart of Skypea. Even looking beyond our crew and speaking of the Nolan flashback. While he was called a liar, in truth he was just a dreamer and an adventurer just like Luffy. He never compromised on any of his beliefs because, again, that is at the heart of this arc. Freedom and adventure. So with all of those triumphs under our belts, the flag of the Straw Hat Pirates flies high, as we, again, in the most out-of-this-world fantasy way possible, descend back down to the Grand Line and continue our journey. Though it is not all sunshine and rainbows, because we have now had our fun time. We've reached the clouds themselves, so now it is time for Oda to bring us both literally and figuratively back to Earth. The problem now is that our seemingly invincible companion Mary is damaged. This is exactly why I stressed Oda's long-form storytelling. It is that stretch of adventures that fundamentally shape our expectations of everything to follow. It is at the height of our adventures that, suddenly, the ship is damaged. The thing that has carried us thus far, the very ground upon which we stand, is damaged. It's from this point on that every single thing in the story is blatantly setting up a series of dominoes, all of which would come crumbling down in Water 7. And the best part? It happens right in front of our eyes because of the expectations laid out by the journey through the Grand Line. The ship is damaged, so that just means a new quest, right? Just like Nami fell sick, surely we can just get some aid, perhaps even another ally. Which takes us to Long Ring Longlands, a severely underappreciated arc, not just because it introduces the most important character, Davy Jones, trust me, you will see in a couple of years, but also because this arc is deliberately there to disarm us. The term, disarming the audience, can be used in a number of different contexts. But generally speaking, it refers to techniques to make the audience, or in this case readers, more susceptible to some sort of argument or emotion or something like that. In fictional stories, that is the usual peaks and valleys type of writing. Which is also why properly done subversions of expectations hit so, so hard. It's exactly because the audience was misled or disarmed. So when the truth finally hits, it hits hard. In the context of the Water 7 story, in hindsight, it almost seems amusing how blatantly Oda was toying with us here. 
The core problem we deal in this arc is losing a crewmate, that being Chopper, and then battling to get him back. But all of that is disguised in a weird and wacky competition against everyone's least favorite character, Foxy. And while the anime does add an ungodly amount of filler that is not actually canon, Robin being taken here as well is of course a very blatant parallel to what would transpire very very shortly. And I know this is a huge huge stretch, but I also find it interesting how before Luffy's final battle against Foxy, Usopp is entrusted with the Straw Hats, making him and Nami the only ones of the crew to ever wear it. Both of whom also happen to pseudo betray Luffy. Don't ever cook again. This also marks a very important shift in Zoro's role, both individually with Chopper, as well as his role as the vice captain. When Chopper is just bawling his eyes out begging for them to save him, Zoro explicitly tells him, We agreed to this game. No pirate would sympathize with your tears. It definitely seems harsh, but this is Zoro respecting Chopper. But that's not all, because it also deliberately shows us that no matter how much someone like Luffy will seek out a fair fight, the world is not a fair place. Justice, and even truth in the world of One Piece, just like it is in our own world, is a very loose and often completely subjective term. And so every single battle against Foxy is completely unfair by design. At every opportunity, he will cheat to get ahead and we are simply left trying to catch up. With him, the cheating angle is of course very very explicit, but the unfairness angle is one we would see with Robin and her being chased down while being a literal kid. But the thing is, at the end of the day, sure Foxy cheated, sure we fought for our crewmates, but all of this was one big joke. The whole of the Davy back fight, especially with the super immature exploits and loopholes and whatnots. This is not a super high stakes fight. And that is exactly why it is placed here. We see a crewmate be taken in pretty goofy fashion. We see Zoro solidify his role as the vice captain. We see Usopp go to bat for Luffy and even wear the straw hats. I'm sure you see where I'm going with this already. Like I say, Oda is very much a long form story enjoyer. But there is one more thing that I've yet to mention that happens in this arc. The appearance of Aokiji. If everything we've talked about this far was about how the Straw Hats have triumphed because of their unity, then Aokiji's appearance is the first thing to sow doubts. Because we suddenly realize that, wait, wait we don't really know Robin's Who story now, do we? You? But the thing is, we are still not challenged. Even this amounts to largely nothing because again, Oda is disarming us. Surely if any of this was going to amount to anything in the foreseeable future, one, we probably would have elaborated on at least some of it, and two, surely Aokiji would have done something. So surely, this is setting up something for far, far later down the line. Or is it? Hey Vsauce, Michael here. Which finally brings us to Venice. Yes, I know that is the most unique joke of all time, but okay, we reach Water 7. And it's here where Oda lets all of those dominoes fall. Minute. And when I say all, I really do mean all of them. Pure numbers wise, aside from some of the most recent arcs of the manga, which I obviously won't spoil, I am pretty sure that Water 7 has the most things going on at the same time. All of which will hit exponentially harder because of everything we've been talking about thus far. Soon after we arrive, Robin just disappears on what was meant to be a casual shopping trip. No build-up, no fights, just a single, somewhat eerie encounter and she disappears without a trace. So at this point, one of our main goals is finding Robin because clearly she must have been captured or something along those lines. But most importantly, unlike with Nami and Arlong Park, we as the audience are also kept in the dark as to what is truly going on with her. On the other side of the story, we see another group head to the shipyard in search of our next straw hat, and there too, things quickly take another turn. Thus far in One Piece, the line between friend and foe, especially when it comes to major arc villains, was crystal clear. The moment we landed in Alabasta, we knew Crocky is the bad guy. Soon after we arrived at Skypea, we knew of Enaru, and so on. With Water 7 on the other hand, things are far far different. Because the first glimpses of a potential antagonist we see is Frankie who at this point in time was still wearing his bizarre mask which is still kinda random. But this too diverts our attention and makes us think that he might be connected with Robin's disappearance and the mysterious CP9. In reality however, the true antagonists turn out to be the exact people we were looking for, the shipwrights. The reason why that comes completely out of the blue is not just because it turns out to be a betrayal, I mean of course that's surprising. 
but rather that that is deliberately constructed to go against how Oda usually writes his arcs. We've had many, many instances of seemingly villains becoming allies. But this is the first time where our allies, especially those written with such rich personalities, turn out to be not just villains, but the true villains who would shape not just this entire saga, but also a pivotal role in Luffy's story. Rather than just being strong antagonists, everything about them is far more insidious. Not only because of the betrayal, but also because they would manipulate one of our own. But okay, let's take a step back because their villainry is of course yet to be revealed. Rather, on top of Robin's mysterious disappearance, we are told that the Mary is beyond repair. At the same time, the equally mysterious Frankie beats up Usopp, yoinks all of our doubloons, and for a little while, two just disappears. And this is where things take a turn compared to everything we had seen before. Because while our march on the Frankie house is certainly a nice bit of catharsis, it changes nothing. The money is already gone. The ship is still beyond repair, and Robin is still missing. Sure, we get some sweet revenge for them attacking our buddy, but this is not Arlong. No one has been saved. But while I say it changes nothing, it does mean something. This is Luffy standing up for his crew. This is Luffy carrying that burden no matter where it takes them. And that is perfectly showcased by him announcing that this is the end of the road for the Mary. What I think is very important to stress here is that, while we use the word flagship a lot as a figure of speech and a metaphor, it originates from just that. The most well-known, often largest, and most important ship of a fleet carrying the distinguishing flag. And while we don't currently have a fleet, the Mary is our flagship. This isn't some random boat that we can just swap out. This is the ship that first carried the sails and the flag of the Straw Hat Pirates. But now, it is falling apart. In both a literal and figurative sense, their home is falling apart. And then we have Usopp. He knows he's weak, but he saw Bragi and Dori. He made a promise to himself that he would sail the seas atop the Mary and become that brave warrior of the sea. But when he had to fight and keep that money to repair the Mary, he was helpless. He lost, and once again, instead of fighting himself, it is the crew fighting for him. So when Luffy finally tells him that they are retiring the Mary, he just snaps. He already feels guilty for how they've treated the Mary. He feels guilty about losing the money. He feels guilty for not being able to stand up for himself. I think in his mind, much of this is very much about the Mary, but I think much of this is also about him and his weakness. The scene in the cabin will always stick out to me as one of the most depressing in all of One Piece, because this is a story of unity. It's one of freedom and adventure, of bringing about a new dawn of unadulterated joy. But here, it is a sunset. There is a long, long night ahead, and that dawn is still a ways off. The crew is falling apart, not through some battle or villain, but us. We are falling apart. Our flagship is falling apart. We don't know what's happening to Robin, and worse yet, Usopp is explicitly telling Luffy that if he's to abandon the ship, he will fight for it. This is no longer Nami or Chopper being taken or disappearing to somewhere. There is an actual fracture forming, one that seems to be irreparable. No enemies to defeat, no one to ask for help. All of this weighs on Luffy's shoulders and his shoulders alone. He, the captain, must make an impossible decision. He has to choose between what is the objective truth in retiring the Mary so that their crew can continue their journey, but completely alienate his friend in the process. Or does he just humor Usopp? Does he go along with this illusion of hope for the Mary just to not sever that bond? He couldn't, right? He has a responsibility to the rest of the crew. He can't lie to all of them just because of some naive dream. It is his duty as the captain to take care of the rest of the crew, not to sell them a fantasy. But if he doesn't, will there even be a crew left? We have now lost two members and the ship. The tragedy of Luffy and Usopp's fight, in my opinion, comes not just from how much care Oda put into disarming us with both the wider story of One Piece and Long Ring Long Land in particular, but also from the relatability of it all. Punching an Eminem lookalike lightning god is not something we really know. Sure, you can depict struggle in an intense battle, but by default, there has to be some pretty intense suspension of disbelief. Arguing with a friend, though, we all know that. Saying things you know you don't really mean and wish to take back. Fearing that you might be burning bridges that could never be rebuilt again. All of these are very, very real human fears. 
I think most of us have had an argument where you want to help or even protect the other person from something, and you are trying to talk them into or out of doing something, but they won't listen. You want to help them, you want them to be happy, every harsh word coming out of your mouth is because you care about them, but still, they don't listen. And that's exactly why this fight hurts so, so much. There is no one to root for here. Sure, we know Luffy's the rational one in the situation, but that doesn't change anything because this is not rational. On the flip side, you might want Usopp to finally stand up for what he believes in and hold his own against Luffy. But again, we don't want them to hurt each other. These are friends tearing each other apart. Through thick and thin, our crew remain unshaken. No matter the foe, no matter the challenge, we face it together. But here, we are the challenge and no one can help. All they can do is just stand by and watch. For the first time ever in the series, both leading up to the fight as well as during it, Luffy wears a stone cold mask. He talks to basically no one on the crew aside from a few words. Right now, he is not their friend, he is their captain. He respects them and this is why he is doing this. But at the same time, his true face, the face of their whimsical meat-loving best buddy, is shown to us through the occasional peer into the past. Raising the flag for the first time, which too is Usopp's doing, their songs about Usopp becoming a brave warrior of the sea, silly arguments about their spots on the ship, Luffy is just falling apart. His crew is everything to him. So when the fight is finally over, he just mumbles, this is really tough. All the while Sanji holds back Chopper, saying that if he were to go help Usopp, he'd be disrespecting and hurting him even more. While Zoro, just like with Long Ring Longland, is very blunt in his vice captain role, saying, this is what it means to be a captain. If you cannot be decisive, who can we believe in? Clear the ship. We can never return again. It's that disarmament and the Stone Cold Zoro we've seen before that makes the scene cut so, so deep. With Chopper and Foxy, while, again, the stakes were technically high and Zoro's words were still powerful, everything surrounding that really wasn't. So it's not the surprise of Zoro suddenly saying these words, rather, it is the context in which it happens. When we cut to Water 7 and the stakes here, he effectively says, Usopp is no longer with us, this is no longer our home. If you do not agree with that, you are no longer my captain and I am leaving. The very next morning, obviously everyone is still in shambles, with Luffy sitting alone and just looking out at something, somewhere. But Oda just keeps on adding spices. Because almost right away, we learn that 1. Iceberg has been shot by Robin, and 2. Aqua Laguna is hitting the city tonight. Aqua Laguna is of course just a very cool world building tool that Oda introduced with... Oh hey, Long Ring Longland, isn't that a coincidence? But yeah, while it is just some really neat flavor to the city, I think it's also meant to convey the overwhelming wave of emotions, challenges, and even more betrayals that the Straw Hats would face. First of those, of course, being the Shipwrights or CP9. Much like I talked about a minute ago, this arc pulls a bit of a reverse Uno in that we have the usual thing of a villain turning into an ally in Frankie, but we also have allies turning out to be the big, big baddies. Not just that, here we are also dealing with the question of, why is Robin tied in with all of this, how much of this is actually out of her control, and about a dozen other whys and hows that were certainly running through our minds during our first time through Water 7. But the thing is, and perhaps this was just my read on the situation, I think Oda was very careful in initially sowing doubts as to whether or not it was actually Robin. As in, every single thing we hear is a second-hand account. And based on the rest of the One Piece story, I don't think it's a stretch to say that everything we hear could simply be Robin being framed. She sailed with us and we trusted her, therefore she must be our ally and this cannot be true. But that is Oda deliberately pushing us into that denial. Because when Sanji catches up to her, she says the same exact thing, telling them that, no, I am never coming back. Just like that, Robin too is no longer a mystery. She leaves, just like Usopp. In the space of, what, 15-20 chapters, two of our crew are gone, seemingly of their own volition. We would of course still learn that with Robin, things are in fact far more complicated. But in terms of how the story unfolds, Luffy is being tested over and over as the captain. Not in strength, but in his ability to keep the crew together when seemingly everything is crumbling down around them. And to hammer that home even further, 
Even when Luffy, Nami, Zoro and Chopper catch up to her, it almost becomes hard not to consider that what she's saying might be true. One, because we know she was researching Pluton back in Alabasta. And two, even to Luffy's face. She says that she cannot achieve her goal if she is with them, and very, very explicitly tells them, we will never meet again. That said though, let's be real, neither we nor Luffy ever believe that this is truly her own desire, but it doesn't matter. With Usopp, we had no one to fight. Here we do, but we are simply too weak. Far, far too weak. It's this moment why I think Water 7, much like Sabote, is an arc the likes of which we will never see again. We have lost the Mary in something that was completely out of our control. She was simply too damaged, beyond repair. There was nothing we could do. We lost Usopp, and sure there was a fight, but that was his decision. There is no way of getting him back, he's not to be saved, he left, plain and simple. And now, we have lost Robin. We try to fight for her, to maybe break through to her in case it is in fact fear that is making her say these things, but we were simply too weak. We can, and we will still fight for her, but the crew is incomplete, and the enemy is so overwhelming that our chances are not looking particularly bright. We have three very, very different types of loss, all of which are extremely personal because these are not side characters or even arc-specific ones. These are one of our own. This is in Vivi where we knew that it is best for her to stay behind. No, we know that we should be together. But no matter how hopeless the situation, our crew is not the one to give up, so while we can't fight for neither Usopp nor the Mary, we are definitely fighting tooth and nail to ask Robin what she truly wants. The crew battles their way through sea trains, a somewhat uncanny number of marines and whatnot, with one very simple goal. Not to free Robin, not to save Robin, but just to hear what it is that she truly wants. Then, and only then, will Luffy be satisfied. There is another 30 plus minute video to be made around Robin specifically, which I will certainly do because she is one half of my favorite characters. But for Luffy, this is exactly what we saw with Usopp. This is him showing his respect for his crew. He will never force them to do anything. He just wants to make sure that what they say they want is what they truly do. In moments like these, Luffy shoots right up to Uncle Iroh levels of wisdom because, again, even if something has changed, they were friends. So now he just wants to make sure that his friend is really doing what they want and that they are safe. That is why this crew puts their lives in Luffy's hands. They know that no matter what, he will stand up for them, no matter what it is they want. Even if it means leaving his crew, Luffy will respect that wish. Even when he is challenged to a duel, he will give them the respect of fighting said duel. To him, allowing his crew freedom is not him showing weakness, that is him showing strength. And so when we finally make it to the rooftop and Luffy hears of all she has to say, he effectively tells her, Okay, I came all the way here. I heard your warnings. I heard your fears. I understand. Now please, let me help you carry some of that burden. And as he commands Soga King himself to shoot down the flag of the world governments, he yells out, Say you want to live. He shows Robin that he means what he says. There is no coming back from this. Robin feared that the world government would pursue the Straw Hats because of her. So Luffy said, Okay, I will show you that I am okay with that, and then you can make up your mind. This is not me promising anything. I will show you that I am okay with this, and then you can make your decision. But there is still our masked companion, and while he too is certainly a legend, with him things are a little bit different. Of course, this is One Piece, so the entire Soga King persona is played up until the very, very end. But because we are taking Luffy's perspective in this video, we will also treat it as such. During Luffy's final stand, Usopp finally removes the mask and reveals himself, blatantly calling out both Luchi and Luffy. Their dynamic here is obviously both wanting to make up, but both knowing that it's not that simple. Practically speaking, of course, Usopp never left. Sure, we had a bit of a falling out, but as soon as we needed him, he was right there by our side and is actually the one to carry out the declaration of war. Though he knows full well that he needs to apologize for the things he said, he realizes that he wasn't the only one hurting over the Mary, and everything Luffy did was because he loved that ship. If we go back to what I said about those arguments you have with your friends, this is why acting as if nothing happened is probably not the healthiest way of going about things. Communication will always be the best solution to these problems. 
If you really can bring yourself to talk about an argument, if that makes you feel uncomfortable, then what kind of trust that really is? But on the flip side, Luffy also doesn't immediately consider him a crewmate. Remember that Luffy sort of deals in absolutes with these things. Usopp told him face to face that he is leaving and he left. Luffy accepted that, he respected that, him showing up here doesn't really change that. Luffy wishes that Usopp asks to return to the crew again, but it's just that, a wish. But even more importantly, we again return to the whole disarming conversation we had. After all the fighting is done and we are fleeing from Garp in Water 7, Usopp still is not on the crew. The fight is done, both want to reunite, but he has not apologized. And so Zoro again steps in saying, you are the captain. We follow you because you respect us and we respect you. If you allow him to just join again as if nothing has happened, that respect is gone and I will be gone next. Everyone else on the crew might say that Zoro is being a stuck up jerk, but he is right. That's exactly what we've seen throughout this entire arc. That is the burden Luffy carries. They are all friends, but they are also crewmates and Luffy is their captain. The only reason why the crew can overcome anything and everything is that unbreakable trust. Everyone, including Zoro, knows that Usopp does not mean what he said, but we need him to apologize regardless, because that is how we keep the crew safe. Trust. If we can't talk about something as hard as regrets and remorse, this whole thing falls apart. And so we need to hear him say it. Usopp needed that rude awakening of the ship leaving in front of his eyes. Those are the consequences of his actions. He wasn't taken away, there is no one coming to save him. He made his own decision, now he must deal with it. And of course, as soon as he screams out, Luffy yoinks him and our long-nosed friend is right back, and thus begins a new part of our journey. To me, the death of the Mary always signified a pivotal turning point in Luffy's character, maybe not quite on the scale of Sabaody, but a vital one in the early parts of One Piece. And while I say Sabaody is worse, I think that is true in certain ways, but not others. Because while this arc's backdrop is the battle against the world governments, the true story of this arc is the crew mourning the death of their ship, dealing with the fallout of those emotions, and dealing with betrayal. We spent a good half of this video talking about the various challenges we faced up until Water 7 and the triumphs of said challenges. It is this arc that tests not our strength, but Luffy as a captain and whether or not he can hold together a crew through a tragedy like the death of the Mary. Without which, I don't think there would be a post time skip if we even got that far. If Nami's pseudo betrayal tested the idea of the Straw Hat Pirates, Water 7 tests the Straw Hat Pirates. It rips them apart to see if they can come back together, even when the world is throwing literal storms at them. It removes the ground on which they stand to see if they can rebuild, and it mounts their unity against the entire world. The reason why I say there will never be an arc like Water 7 is because it proves that everyone on the crew does know that they are a part of something bigger. It may hurt, it may take time, it may even take a fight. But ultimately, their trust in one another will prevail because that is what this crew is about. They know that everything they do is only to benefit one another, no matter how harsh it may initially seem. No matter how bitter the truth, they refuse sweet lies because that would just be unfair to the crew. The burden Luffy carries is a simple but often extremely heavy one. It is love and respect. In a perfect world, these would go hand in hand at all times, but sometimes it's those two things that demand the most difficult of decisions. It's Luffy's love and respect for the Mary that told him that it's time to let her go. But it's also Luffy's love and respect for Robin that told him to declare war on the world government and ask her to come back. And it's also those same two things that told Luffy to let Usopp go and not allow him to return without those two things. That is the burden that Luffy carries. And that's the video. Oh boy, does returning to pre-time skip just hit different? You know Oda was cooking when I get sad looking at my own video. But anyway, I know many of you only follow my two channels for the One Piece and live action stuff, so I wanted to drop a quick thank you here at the end. The Sab Odi video from just a few months back is now sitting at a mind-boggling 175,000 views. And you have no idea how happy I was to see people say that there still were things that they hadn't noticed in the arc until that video. And all the conversations about the Netflix show we're having on the second channel are equally fun. 
Getting into the One Piece community was always a scary thing to do with just how established it was, but these couple of years have been an absolute joy. But okay, my sappiness aside, I want to say equally massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Eddie Grace, Charlie Doggett, Kantai, Bangle64, and Cost Bubbles. Sorry if I butchered the names, but without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye